over to here. So um, just so everyone knows, my name is Nicole Meldahl. I'm executive director of Western Neighborhoods Project, which I actually think everybody already knows. Um, and this is the life and library of Adolf Sutro with our dear friend, Diana from the Sutro Library. Hey everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, this is a webinar. So as you all know, it's not like the Brady Bunch situation where everybody gets to be on screen and you also don't get to talk uh, at least directly to us. So if you have any questions, please just type them in the chat. I will do my best to answer whatever I can. And then Diana will, will answer questions at the end of the show. Um, and as for everything else, oh, and we are recording. So, um, um, just keep in mind that if you have to scooch away for a minute to get a drink or do something else, it's okay. Uh, Definitely drink. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I'm in my office, otherwise I would have a glass of wine right now. But, um, but yes, and we're doing this because, well, the Sutra Libra Library is amazing, but this is also programming uh, to support our brand new museum at the Cliff, which just opened last weekend in the former Cliff House gift shop, where we have a bust of Adolf Sutro and many things formerly owned by Adolf Sutro. So please uh, take notes tonight and visit us this weekend to see these things in action. Yeah, you have stuff from the Egyptian collection too, right? We do or on loan from the Global Museum at SF State. So SF State is is this wonderful amalgamation of a lot of cool stuff focused on the Sutra life, on Sutra's life, right, Diana? Yeah, yeah. And we have his library, but the Global Museum is in stewardship of the Egyptian artifacts that he collected and like about 780 artifacts. So it's pretty amazing. Uh, if you go to the Global Museum, which is open to the public, there are like three sarcophagus like in their exhibit space. So it's pretty amazing. I think they might still be closed because of the pandemic right now. Yeah, um, I think it's, it's a private campus. I mean, Sutro, um, I was gonna tell you, but Sutro is open by appointment. So you can actually come. Um, you just have to make an appointment. And we're only two days a week, so yeah, it's definitely limited. <laughs> we're getting back to normal, right? We are, we are, slowly. <laughs> well, yeah, we, um, uh, and we also did a program with the Global Museum around uh, the, the Egyptian collection that was collected by Sutro. So that's also on our um, Outside Lands um, YouTube channel in case anybody's interested in seeing that. But enough about the Global Museum. I mean, also I, we did a joint exhibit with the Global Museum and we, had artifacts from the let from their museum and books which showed illustrations of those artifacts and if you go to sutra Liga, library omika um you can actually see a lot of that exhibit online and it was actually really really cool to have like the actual artifacts next to these illustrations in these books from the 1600s and 1700s trying to show the world what they look like Sutro did collect an, an, a wide variety of things. <laughs> yeah, like a lot of Victorian men of the time. All right, Diana, why don't we, um, unless there's any further questions, um, uh, why don't we move on with our show? Okay. So I'm going to turn the video off because it'll distract me. Um, and I'm going to start sharing um, some of the great images of history and Sutro. So let me get here. Okay, so thank you so much everybody for coming and joining us today. I worked for the library, um, for the Sutro library since 2011. I literally didn't even know it existed until I just got on an examination list for the state of California and got a, a letter in the mail and really was stunned at this collection that rivals the Bancroft and the Huntington in terms of its importance and the treasures in it. And so it really is even people who have lived in San Francisco their whole lives sometimes don't understand how amazing this collection is. So I want to tell you about the library and about this man who 
wanted to provide this great library to the city of San Francisco. So um, I, as I said, I've worked for the Social Library uh, since 2011. I'm the instruction and outreach librarian. Um, most of the people who do know about the Sutro know it as a genealogy library, which really overshadowed its uh, special collections and antiquarian books and archival collections. So this and the fact that we've never had a permanent home until 2012 when we moved into our shared space here at San Francisco State University. Um, and this was a joint venture. The state voted on a bond measure, which created our home and gave San Francisco State a retrofitted library um, and a beautiful library. We are on the fifth floor of this library. It is open to the public. Right now, because of COVID, um, it's by appointment only. So we have some different uh, steps. But if anyone was interested, I can easily, you could email me or whatever. So we, as I said, are on the campus of San Francisco State University. It's our first permanent home. And today I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about the history of Sutro and of his library. Um, and it's really a part of the social and cultural history of San Francisco. Um, it's one of the many legacies that he has left in the city. Um, the baths, he owned the Cliff House, he, really outside lands was the real estate he had purchased that he was settling and trying to bring people out to that area. So, you know, he he donated the Parnassus campus um, to UCSF. So his legacy is throughout the city. Um, and we, as I said, we have research collections that rival the Huntington and the Bancroft, including the fact that we have not just one, but two first folios of Shakespeare, which only 235 exists, the second most important book in the English language, and uh, besides the King James Bible, which we also have an original printing of. So he has been left, left out of the larger narrative of great research libraries like the Bancroft and like the Huntington, um, but historians have pointed out that it's quite possible that in the annals of American book collecting and library history, there is no collector who has received less recognition in relation to the value and importance of his library than San Francisco entrepreneur Adolf Sutro. So Adolf Sutro wore many hats in the city. He was a mayor in San Francisco. He was an engineer, an entrepreneur, a philanthropist, and like many German Jewish immigrants, he decided to make San Francisco his permanent home. He also always intended to use his wealth to help bring San Francisco into the modern era and make it a sophisticated urban center. And that is why he decided to build a public research library. Unfortunately, Sutro never got around to building the structure for the collection, um, and the library did suffer in the 1906 earthquake followed by the fire. It went from a reported 300 to 500,000 volumes, including manuscripts and maps, to just over 125,000 rare books and antiquary maps and archival collections. We do continue to add to the collections, but his original collection is around 125,000, according to contemporary news reports. So I think when we look at Sutro's life, and all of the things that are happening in the 19th century. The Industrial Revolution is creating changes in all facets of life. Um, there are revolutions all over Western Europe that are forcing people to leave and come to America. And there's the gold rush. So these things are part of Sutro's history as well. Steamboats, for instance, um, made it so that ships didn't really need to rely on wind anymore. So trade and travel was easier than it ever was. So Sutro was born in what was Prussia, but is now Germany, in April 29th, 1830, in the ancient city of Aachen. He came from a largely secular Jewish family and was the third of 11 children. The family owned a cloth making factory, which Sutro worked at, 
and then ran after the death of his father. From an early age, Sutra loved books and learning. And according to one biography, his love of books was taught to him by his father, who with a bent towards science and engineering influenced him, which makes sense because this is also coming out of the enlightenment. Sutra was also passionate about knowledge and proficient in several languages, including Latin, Hebrew, German, and Greek. So to, in Sutra's early life, this city was a cultural and intellectually rich city with an amazing history. And it was at one point the seat of the Holy Roman Empire and early Romans started spas and mineral baths, which are still part of the city's culture today. And so then we think about Sutro is coming to America in 1850. And in history, we talk about push and pull. And definitely within the mid 19th century, you have revolutions in Prussia that force a mass migration. That, and coupled with the increasing anti Semitism, easing immigration restrictions, really pushed many out of Western Europe. And Sutro's family was a part of this wave of immigrants that left the region to go to the United States in 1848 through 1850. And Sutro's family, like a lot of other families, entered the New York City and they ended up settling in Baltimore. And this is the, the picture of the ship that Sutro and his family actually came over on. And here is a passenger list where you see the mother at the top who is 45. And then there's Sutro, Adolf Sutro in line 217. He's 20 years old. It's 1849, July. And it also details everything that they're traveling with. So Sutro, like other people coming into New York City, would have reached the docks of New York City and people would be talking about the gold rush. It was all people were talking about. And so like other young men at the time, Sutra decided he was gonna seek riches and test his fortunes in California. And so here are just a couple of document. Well, this is a document, a map of the gold regions that is from our collection. It actually gives tips on what each route is, what to take with you. Sutro himself came from New York across the Isthmus of Panama. And it wasn't always a pleasant journey. It was actually really difficult and people got sick. They had to travel on mules, horses, as well as like in rivers. So it was a pretty treacherous journey. And once across the Isthmus, this steamship, took him to San Francisco. And so this is what San Francisco would have looked like when Sutro arrived. So Sutro, like a lot of like industrious young people and just everyone during this time went into the trade business, became a merchant. And he did suffer a number of small business reversals in the 1850s, but he did finally establish himself as a tobacconist. However, in 1863, news of the Comstock hit. And probably a lot of you already know, but if, just in case if you don't, the Comstock created Nevada as a state. The riches from that, built the mint in San Francisco, created the banks, just, it was the largest silver and gold vein ever discovered in the Americas. So this is a news report of that. And Sutro, like many others would have read it. And so Sutro had actually considered setting his fortunes for Virginia City where the Comstock load was. So he actually went there to Dayton, which was a city right by the Comstock, and opened a refining mill to extract silver quartz called the Sutro Metallurgical Works. And it did a modest profit. However, he had always been thinking about a grander idea, and that was a tunnel, a four mile tunnel, 1500 feet below ground through the Comstock load to drain the water and ventilate the many different mines that, and then allowing silver to be extracted and also permitting miners to bring out silver ore. And then this is a, a, a 
in the Daily Alta in 1866, showing Sutro applying to the land office for this land in order to build his tunnel. So looking at these papers, you know, Sutro was around a lot of our icons of Western history. And while he was here in Virginia City and working on his tunnel, he met Mark Twain, and who was called Samuel Clemens at the time, but actually changed his name to Mark Twain in Virginia City and spoke about Sutro and his tunnel in a footnote in Roughing It saying, Mr. Sutro, the originator of this pernicious enterprise, is one of the few men in the world who is gifted with the pluck and perseverance necessary to follow up and hound such an undertaking to its completion. He has converted several obstinate Congresses to a deserved friendliness towards his important work and has gone up and down and to and fro in Europe until he has enlisted a great moneyed interest in it there. And indeed, Sutro spent 15 years working on this tunnel. He lobbied Congress, he convinced miners and the state of Nevada to back him, he gained finance from European sources, he fought William Ralston and the Bank of California who wanted to get in on these riches, every step trying to derail Sutro, but nevertheless, Sutro finished the tunnel in 1878. He subsequently sold that tunnel to various investors and returned to San Francisco, a multimillionaire. And just to say this, shortly after the mines dried up and the tunnel was useless, so he made money on a short sale. But again, it took 15 years of his life, probably cost him his marriage, definitely a lot of time with the children and a lot of stress. So, Sutro comes back to San Francisco in 1880, and he decided this is going to be his permanent home. And so to that end, he decided he was going to use his riches not only to buy real estate, but to help make San Francisco a sophisticated, modern city. And so just so you know, like at this point in time, Oscar Wilde actually came through San Francisco in 1882 and called it a ramshackle frontier quality kind of city. So San Francisco definitely needs some polishing and Sutro was there to do it. So here is just, this is a, after his death, um, it talks about how much land he actually did own in the city and various reports have said a 12th or whatever, this particular article says that he owned an eighth of all of the property in San Francisco, which is a lot. So he decided, as I said, to make San Francisco his home. And he built a very fancy house at Sutro Heights. He bought 22 acres above the Cliff House in 1881. And this is the gate. He actually, he made it a, a big park. There was an indoor botanical garden and he allowed people on Wednesdays and Saturdays to come in and use the park. Although he didn't want anyone eating food there. Um, he finally got a dwelling built. So and this is a picture of that. And here he is on his horse. And these are other scenes from Sutro Heights. So, in 1883, he also purchased the Cliff House. Um, and he still wanted to be a, an important, as an important civic-minded person, he wanted to be involved in San Francisco's evolution. And so one of the things he did is start Arbor Day in the city. And this is just kind of a fun little description by Joaquin Miller, who talks about this Arbor Day and talks about its origin. And here he says, visiting my dear old friend of other days, Adolf Sutro, he asked me to plant a tree, an old custom in Europe. Finding he had planted millions of trees and had trees to give to all who would plant, the idea of an Arbor Day already in the air, perhaps, began to take solid form. And then he goes on to describe what that day was like. And that Sutro donated 40,000 trees to plant to school children. And then there's a description of the scene, which I just think is so charming and lovely. Who can forget the scene? The ships, the booming guns, 
the thousands and thousands of happy school children, Sutra planting the first tree, dear old General Leo on horseback, making his speech in Spanish, his very last speech and last public appearance, senators, governors, officers in glittering uniforms, a thousand pretty women, and gentle General Howard carrying water up hill, the hill all day with his one arm to water the children's trees. So Sutro also uh, was a self-taught engineer and he built that tunnel and he also engineered the Sutro Bass. And in 1896, the Sutro Bass opened to the public and it was a massive glass enclosure containing one freshwater tank with six saltwater tanks, all at various temperatures. And the pools together held 1,685,000 gallons of seawater and could be filled or emptied in one hour by high or low tides. Um, you could rent a bathing suit there, 20,000 for rent and 40,000 towels for rent. You could ride on slides and you could go on a trapeze and a springboard and a high dive. So during all of this flurry of acti activities, Sutro is actually actively building this, this research library to give to the citizens of San Francisco and to help making this great urban center and make a world-class library. And so he hired people to go around the world and he himself traveled around, bought books at auctions, entire collections. And in Britain, they called him the California Book Ban. Um, and there were articles about what the library is gonna look like. And here's a plan of the main floor and of the basement. And so this was his dream. And then he decided to become the mayor. And in 1895, he ran against the railroad interest, the octopus. And also Huntington hired some Pinkertons to try to find some dirt on Sutro. However, ended up concluding that Sutro was actually a pretty, unimpeachable character, which really upset him. He said, Huntington said, Call him, called him a pestiferous cuss and as incorruptible a man, I think, as there is on the West Coast. So Sutro is, according to most history books, the first Jewish mayor of a major American city. Um, and he was only mayor for a couple of years. He didn't have a lot of power. He did support women's suffrage, um, but the power was the board of supervisors and he never really got along with them. And just a year after he died, and this is his obituary, which is a full spread in the San Francisco call um, with his contributions and his life. So as I said, Sutro had been collecting all through this time. He had amassed anywhere from 300,000 to half a million rare books, including 4,000 in Canabula, which are the first printed books. So from 1440 through 1501, we only have 58 of those left um, because what happened is he died in 1898 and the family sort of bickered over what to do with this collection and they didn't donate the collection to the California State Library until 1913. So from 1898 to 1906, it was stored downtown in two different locations, the Montgomery Block and Battery. And then in 1906, San Francisco burned. And so did two thirds of this very important, amazing collection. And since then, we've never had a permanent home. So finally, the, fi the library or the families decided to donate the library to the state of California in 1913. And um, it was shuffled around in various different places. Uh, it was at the San Francisco Public Library in the basement for a while. It was behind the San Francisco State University in an old building back 
with good parking, but um, yeah. So finally we're in our permanent home. This is a book plate that Sutro plate cre uh, created, but we still use. And now I just wanna sort of go over some of the amazing things that we have in this collection. So Sutro didn't wanna copy what Bancroft was doing at the time, which was Pacific Northwest history. So what Sutra did was he based his model on the German university model, which makes sense because he's coming from Prussia. That German university model is our sort of modern liberal arts education where you learn a little bit about everything. And so Sutro, to that end, collected every subject you could possibly imagine. Um, we're obviously famous for the first folio because there just aren't that many that exist. And it is such an important work in the English language. As I said, the King James Bible is the, the second most important book in the English language. This is the first. So the first folio is important for several reasons. It was compiled by his fellow actors and fellow partners in his theater company. It's obviously was so important because folios are bigger books. So anything that was printed in 1623 of that size was usually something that was pertained to religion, philosophy, something that was very important, but literature and entertainment wasn't necessarily something you put in a printed form. So that actually is another indicator of why this work is so important. But his partners also understood like the proper form of the plays. And so there were many pirated, really lesser versions of his plays that people had stolen. There's no real copyright, but they had taken this intellectual property. And so this book helped to provide an authorized version of the plays to codify these plays, but also to codify the English language. So. Yeah, we're very lucky that we have this book. Um, we actually have two of these, and then we have a second, third, and fourth folio printing of the place. So that's just one thing, and it is the most like popular, but I don't necessarily think it's the most interesting. We have Psalters that have belonged to kings of England, um, and they're just beautiful because of their bindings and because of the provenance, which is its history of ownership and the beautiful clasps. And as I had said earlier, Sutro had one of the largest collections of Incanabula and we only have about 58 um, right now or now, but this is a beautiful example of an Incanabula. And the decorated, um, initial at the beginning of the paragraph is sort of a leftover from medieval manuscripts and the way in which they were doing illumination. Um, we also actually have this book of ours, which is all hand done. So all of this was hand printed. Um, another really interesting collection that we have is our Hebraica collection. This collection um, belonged to an antiquities dealer in Jerusalem um, who in 1880s tried to sell some fragments that to the British Museum that if authenticated would have at the time predated the Dead Sea Scrolls. So basically they would have been contemporary with Moses. And he was sort of this guy Shapiro was publicly shamed and the documents were supposedly proved false and he committed suicide. And so Sutro went in and purchased the, the entire store contents from the bank. Um, so we have this amazing collection of Yemenite scrolls from the 1300s through the 1800s. And this was an exhibit that we did and you can see how amazing they are and just, just so amazing. And Actually, we there's a professor um, at San Francisco State who wrote a whole book about this Shapira affairs, what people call it, 
Um, and it is really fascinating. And uh, apparently he used our collection to solve the mystery, but other scholars have come along and said not so much. So to be continued. We have a lot of stuff from the Enlightenment and our collection of Sir Joseph Banks papers is pretty incredible. Sir Joseph Banks went on the first circumnavigation of the globe with Captain Cook and came back with Captain Cook and they were both superstars. They went to Tahiti, they brought back artifacts, they brought back new flowers. And then this is a sketch of the bounty. So Joseph Banks was sort of this figure in, in British history who was part of this Royal Society of Science who was helping to promote technology and information exchange across countries, regardless of what is going on, because he's working through the American Revolution and he's working through the French Revolution. Um, this is a sketch of the bounty. bounty. I'm sure many of you have like, or maybe you don't know about the mutiny on the bounty. Well, this is a sketch of that ship by William Bly himself, who was mutinized against. Um, and so we have these amazing documents. Uh, the, our bank's collection is an archival manuscript collection of 10,000 documents. Within that is also uh, an entomology section. So Joseph Banks, as I said, was really interested in technology. And at the time, the color red was really difficult to dye. And the Spanish had a monopoly on it for hundreds of years because they invaded the new world and they had domesticated this insect called cochineal on these Nepali cactus plants and been able to use these insects to create this incredible red. And red was a very difficult color uh, to keep saturated in, in fabric. So the science, this is sort of like industrial espionage. So we have samples of cochineal within this collection too, because Joseph Banks had his hands in all kinds of pots. Uh, we have a ton of natural history books. Uh, these books started out as books to provide information and detail. And then they sort of evolved and it wasn't just the detail, it was that it was art as well. Um, that we have a huge collection of Asian artifacts and, and, and books. Uh, our Japanese collection, we have hundreds of woodblock prints from the Edo period. Here's, oops, here's an example of, I think it's Hiroshigi, but we have some of the greats and this is a wrestling, a sumo wrestling scene. Uh, we also have this beautiful 10 volume set of photos from Japan uh, from 1875. And our Mexicana collection is pretty amazing. Sutra basically was traveling through Mexico, the oldest principal publishing and printing house bookstore in Mexico City was for sale. He bought everything, including what was in the wastebasket. So a lot of history of printing in Mexico. And so we also have one of the one of the oldest academic libraries in the Americas. They are all fire branded. We have a huge collection of those, and you can tell where they're from by the fire brands. There's even a whole website that you can look at the different fire brands and see their provenance, their history of ownership. Um, part of this is this is the first law book printed in the Western Hemisphere um, in 1548. Um, we have things on, so this is a whole series of images of Aztec ruins and artifacts that were sort of pillaged and brought back to Western Europe. And then this guy wanted to go in and, and, and make sure that they were recorded. Um, and also kind of thought maybe the Aztecs were like 
one of the last tribes of Israel. So that's a whole interesting history. I think I'm going over my time. So as I had said before, the sutra has never had a permanent home. Here's a really sort of like redux of where it's been. So from 1913 to 1923, it was Elaine Medical, which then became Stanford. It was at San Francisco Public Library in its basement from 1923 to 1960. And it's so hard to see these images of all of these old amazing books stored under leaking water. Anyway, uh, there's a little picture of the reading room. And then it went to UCSF for a little bit. And then it was moved finally to behind San Francisco State University. Um, and that's when I came in in 2011, right as we were moving into our new and final home. So as I said, we're on the fifth floor. Um, you can come and visit us by appointment. Um, this is what the entrance area looks like. This is a view from the library. This is the entrance. So whenever you come, because we're a special collection and we have old stuff, we ask that you put all your stuff in a locker and sign in. And this is part of the reading room. This is our just part of our vault, which is humidity and temperature controlled. Um, and this is our homepage. So if you have a reference question or you wanna look in our catalog, if you wanna send us a reference question, go to the Ask a Librarian on the far right. Um, and often we'll, we'll look up and we can copy things for you. Um, we can help you find certain things, even if we don't have it. Um, and so that's, that's where my story ends. Thank you so much, Diana. Yeah. This might be one of the most informative um, programs we've ever we've ever hosted. <laughs> I'm coming back. My video is back on if you want to bring your video back on too. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me do that and then stop share. There we go. Okay. There we go. I we did have one question. Richard Brandy wanted to know if you ever put on exhibitions of the different holdings that Sutra had from time to time. We do. We actually have like nine exhibit cases. If you go to our Sutra library here, let me just um, see if I can, I'll get a link. Our Sutra library, Amika, has some of our stuff online, including um, our Women's March posts, like some, of, not even all, but some of our Women's March posters, but they're so amazing. But if you wanted to see some of our past exhibits, we have, um, stuff that we we displayed in those exhibits on Amika. Um, here, I'll just put the link in the chat um, because you can see all kinds of stuff there. It's, um, we've got several exhibits up there, including I think a hundred of our Women's March posters. Oh, that's, I, I'm seeing a Game of, Thron a Th Game of Thrones pop-up exhibit. Who gets to curate your exhibitions? Uh, we kind of all do. So uh, for the pop-ups, which were so fun, um, we have book lists. So if anyone wants to know what we pulled, we can show you. Um, what happens is we all sort of like find our, our ideas and we'll come together. So there's four of us and we'll choose maybe five works, set it all out, and then sort of curate it all together and decide what we like best. Do you have any uh, content? Now I'm just going to ask all the questions I've been wanting yeah, yeah, yeah. for five years. Do you have any content related to Dr. Emma Sutro Merritt? Mostly, and it's unprocessed. Uh, most of her stuff is at the Huntington. <gasps> How yeah. do, so a I, I little sneak peek is one of the other conversations we've been having with the Sutro Library is doing like a deep nerd archives panel in which we try to figure out why the Sutro collection went to so many different places and what's where and how things ended up. And you said it's at the Huntington Library. When did it go there? Did you know? I don't because I'm assuming that she donated or her heirs did. Like mm -hmm. Sutro's heirs ended up donating the library to the state of California. And then they donated like the, the Sutro papers, there's some at San Francisco Public Library, there's mm -hmm. some at the Bancroft, there's some at the Huntington. 
The only reason I know Amma Sutro is down there is because Maddie, the director of the Sutro, has personally gone down there to find stuff. And it's and she was told, you know, it's just a, an unprocessed collection. And so there's not a lot of access to it, quite frankly. Oh, gosh, I'm going to have to go on sabbatical and go back to where I'm from. I'm actually from where the Huntington Library is so I can process oh. the papers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just I think the more reference requests they get, oh, just, the more they might be able to process it. We'll just because, blow them up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think you should, you could still try. I mean, I think you could still go in and, and see stuff. It's just there's no order to it. Oh gosh, my archivist brain has just exploded. Yeah, um, yeah, 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 for sure. Oh, Kevin wants to know, do you know exactly what was lost in the 1906 earthquake? It wasn't fully cataloged. He <sighs> totally was diverted by being mayor and then died a year later, like just never finished it out. So, I mean, there were 4,000 in Cannabula. We have, I don't know, 58 that we know of, because sometimes we don't know everything we have because it hasn't all been cataloged, like so many archives yeah. and special collections. So, um, I mean, I think we have a card catalog that has a lot of Sutra's original collection, but it's hard to know how much of that, like, I just don't think a lot of it was cataloged. Yeah. Is that yeah. catalog original to the collection? <gasps> yeah, we have his original and it's in the reading room. It's really cool. Yeah, because um, that way it's something that we use for provenance because it shows that it's been with Sutro for that whole time. Is it his handwriting or did he hire someone to be his personal librarian? He had a librarian. Oh my God. Yeah, he had a personal librarian. His so. staff must have been bananas. His landscaping staff alone must have been. Yeah, I mean, we have a photo album of Sutra. It's like two actual photo albums of Sutra Heights. And actually, you know, so many images have been digitized at the California State Library. If you go to the catalog and here, why don't I just share? Because it's not necessarily intuitive. Um, <laughs> Let's do that. For Library websites rarely are, except plug opensfhistory.org, thanks to David Gallagher's work. <laughs> oh, yes, for sure. Um, okay, so just real quick. How about that? Whoop, nope, I don't care about that. <laughs> I'm not getting that. <laughs> um, Oh yeah, Mary Rose is confirming what you said earlier that ever, uh, that she thought about the uh, you as mostly a genealogical library, but you have yeah. some more. Yeah, because it was it, it's actually in terms of genealogy, if you're interested in that, it's a very top notch genealogy family history library. We have so many original family histories. It's pretty amazing. Um, so here, let's just do Sutro Heights. And so if you, this is just our homepage, just choose catalog, and then you can start to refine from here. And this is, this is where, if you go to the picture catalog, mm. you can find all kinds of images that like they're all, there's available high def, um, but just they're all, pretty much in the open domain and so if you come down here you can see what it looks like so there's one but so that's just one of the great picture places you can find good images um I know on here somewhere it's there is like a, a picture of Sutro and his staff at Sutro Heights and it's like 25 people so yeah it's he had a huge staff he, it's, I mean, Sucho gave the city so much and almost all of it is gone now. I, it's one of the things we've been talking a lot about um, I, when, I, we're at, when we're at the museum because folks look all around them and they can't see anything and then they're seeing vestiges of it in our photographs. And I think the library is the, the thing that I'm most upset about losing a significant part of. It's, it's still amazing. I mean, 
Someone saved the first folio. Actually, I think it was his daughter. We have like a letter from a, a sort of librarian at the time and they like broke through the Presidio soldiers who were guarding the area that had burned and they were able to get some stuff. And supposedly the first folio was one of those. So yeah, no, it's definitely tragic, but there's still so much. We have so much. So we have a couple more questions. Kevin wants to know how much of Sutro's correspondence is there at the library? Um, it, it, okay, we, on the Online Archive of California, you can find us and there's like finding guides on there that have lists of some of the correspondence. A lot of our correspondence, ha, like there's correspondence between him and his family in Germany. There's correspondence regarding the tunnel. Um, I mean, actually there's a lot of correspondence that we have. It's just not all of it. Like his collections have been spread between us, the Huntington, San Francisco Public Library, the Bancroft. So, um, but yeah, it just, it, it sort of depends. We can, like, you can either go to our website and we can send you the finding aid directly, which is like a shelf list. It just lists items. Um, or you go to the OAC and take a look. There's sort of a, a follow-up question from Gary who wants to know if there are financial accounts in Sutro's in the in your library. Yeah, there's some, yeah, well, there's library receipts. There's receipts for different things he purchased for his house. Yeah, yeah, there's tons of receipts, as they say. I feel <laughs> like the um, uh, always present in the room when Sutro's discussed John Martini, um, has looked through a catalog or some, some kind of financial ledger, either at the history center, maybe it was at your library. I can't remember, but I do know that he has poured through some sort of financials, Gary. So, um, maybe follow up and I can ask John Martini where he got that, in, that information. From. Sure. Yeah, no, I'm definitely familiar with him. He, he, like him and so many people in his circle, they know all about, they know everything. <laughs> they really know everything so he's the encyclopedia for the Sutro Baz um, in okay. fact we have his book um, at the museum it's out of print right now unfortunately so we aren't we don't have any copies to sell here but um, I like secretly people ask me a question and I'm like oh just let me just let me look it up I, for I a second probably I bet we have his book yeah. you know we definitely have books about Sutro. <laughs> well, what's your favorite thing? What's your favorite piece in the collection that you've stewarded so far? Oh, it's so hard. <laughs> um, there's so many things. Like one of the things I've recently looked into for our American, because we have American Revolution, because we have a huge English, British history, mm -hmm. which obviously intersects with American colonial revolution, right. revolutionary history. So we have all of these great newspapers from the 1770s, 1780s from Britain wow. talking about various things about like slavery, but various things about the tea, like people like destroying tea. So like the tea party, like it is the stamp act. Like it's like, you're seeing history from headlines in newspapers. So, I, but like, it's just so hard. There's like a lot of cool medical books. Like we have the second anatomy book ever printed from 1545. What? So cool, so beautiful and weird and interesting. And I mean, we just have so much. It's real. I mean, we have beautiful photographs interesting photographs, um, military history, just, yeah, it's, uh, how can you ask? Oh, yeah, you could go to Ask a Librarian on our website, <laughs> on our homepage. Funny. It's on the upper right. <laughs> Pam, I, it's funny you should say that because I hate when people ask me that same question, but it is always the thing that I'm curious about because like I know what my favorites are, um, depending on what day it is. 
but okay, yeah. um at least well I don't know about your collection but like in our collection yeah it shifts every single day like what you're whatever you've you've discovered next is the thing you're thinking about the most and the thing you want to know more about so it's true it's a good call Pam <laughs> Do you? We also have like thousands of travel narratives from the 1500s through the 1900s. So those are also really, really interesting. One thing that we, I've, I've noticed people have been asking about the Global Museums collection because I've been staffing the museum is why is it important to have these kinds of international cultural artifacts available? for us here in San Francisco? Like, why shouldn't it be, why shouldn't these pieces be in the in the, the country of origin? Like, why should it be here? And I'm interested to hear what your answer is. Okay, so there's a, there's a, like, I, it's hard to answer this question, but I will say this, that Napoleon invaded Egypt in 1799, maybe, through 1801. And what happened is I think Britain came in and helped defend Egypt. And what Egypt did to say thanks to other countries was give them monuments. So like all of the needles, the Cleopatra needles, those were literally given to the US, to England uh, as a thank. So some of those artifacts were given away by the Egyptian government, right or wrong. But some of them were still, I mean, grave robbing. I mean, the exploitation of Egyptian artifacts, it's hard to say, like, I don't know necessarily how, to, like, I know about his library. I don't know how he acquired those Egyptian artifacts, but, you know, some, as I said, were given away by Egypt. Some of them were stolen, so. Yeah, that's a hard one. I was, um, I got into a discussion today with someone actually, because um, I was trying to put in perspective, like in, in Adolf Sutra's time, most people were not ever going to have access to these artifacts in their country of origin. Most people didn't travel. It was way too expensive. It was ex too expensive to get out to the West Side for a lot of people. So having these artifacts present in San Francisco providing an educational opportunity not accessible to most people. And in that sense, it situates Sutro as the populace that he was. Although I don't know, we can't speak for his motivations as a collector. No, the, the library was meant to be a public research library. He meant it to be available to everyone. And that's kind of the sense that I got too. We got a question here from Tim Van Ram. If Adolf had a dog, I don't know if it's true, Tim, but in the library or in the museum, we have like a, a, a fold out folio of scenes from Sutra Heights. And there's a group of dogs, one named Jumbo and the other one named Jumbo Jr. So it's like a big dog and a puppy. I don't know if <laughs> Diana, you can confirm that this was actually the name of Sutro's dogs. <laughs> I don't, but I know that his monkey's name was Jack and that Jack was very mischievous and that Sutro really liked him, but there was an article about Jack who he was kind of like, I don't know, troublesome. He plucked every feather off of a bird. Like he was a lot. He did all kinds of antics. So, I mean, owning a monkey, just think there's a lot there might be a lot of problems owning monkeys. I can I can confirm that my mother had a monkey had two monkeys when she was um and her a teenager one was named Harvey which is hilariously my boyfriend's name now um <laughs> but my grandmother came home one day and he had opened up all the kitchen cabinets and pulled out every single plate like gingerly like set them down <laughs> and just unpacked <laughs> Yeah, that's what the article made the monkey sound like. So I don't think Sutra ever wanted to get rid of it, but I think he was sort of forced to cage it. Oh, oh, and that's what that, we've seen some like topiary kind of thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that makes sense. We do have photos of uh, Jack the monkey. I'm so, this has been the greatest <laughs> moment of this presentation. No offense, learning the monkey's <laughs> name. <laughs> um, uh, and he's like chained up and it's Sutro like- kind Oh of yeah, yeah. <laughs> We have that photo framed in our vaults. 
This yes, we do. Amazing. Lindy wants to know how Jack, do you want to know how Jack died or how Adolf Sutro died? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anything about the dogs. Um, I don't know how the monkey died, oh, okay. but Sutro, I think he, it, in the papers, it just sounded like he was, deter- like he might've had Alzheimer's. Like it, it does sound like he was suffering from some kind of dementia and he was fairly young. I think he was what, like, so he was born in 1820, died in 1898. So 68, like that's young. So I think it might've been dementia or something like that. But it did say that like in the newspapers that, you know, his daughter, Emma had to like actually kind of fight the rest of the family and like take him into like a more like cared environment, like a more supervised environment, um, because I guess he wasn't necessarily making the best decisions during his last year. So that's, I think that's probably what he died from. I thought I read somewhere, maybe it was a John Martini quote that it was um, diabetes and sort of a dementia that onset from all the complications of diabetes. Maybe I made that up. No, um, that, I mean, uh, yeah, it could be that. I mean, I just read local articles. And I mean, at that point, I don't think anyone really yeah. probably knew. That's true. Um, oh, Margaret is asking, can we confirm the hours for the museum at the cliff? Yes, there is some <laughs> confusion online. Uh, it's Thursday through Sundays, 11 to 4 p.m. Uh, please come by and visit. It is very teeny tiny. It is not the whole cliff house as people have been pointing out. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay because we have no damage from the storm in our area so we're very happy with our choice <laughs> and the weather's been great out there I mean today was amazing you all should visit just for the view from our back patio um but does are there any other questions for Diana while we have her since she's the expert here um <laughs> you know a lot so I mean, hands down, learning the monkey's name has been the highlight of my week. (laughs) We talk about that monkey a lot. (laughs) You know what? I have found so many great articles in the um, UC Irvine's, the California digital newspapers, like the historic. We have a link to it on our website, but just looking at some of the old articles, they're just, they're great. Like, you know, you find stuff on the monkey. I mean, now as in the past, journalists had a nose for the ridiculous that would definitely sell papers. And I mean, now how many years later, I'm still like monkey things? <laughs> like, yeah, and give me a pun in that headline, I'm sold. <laughs> I do have a deep fondness for old timey newsprint when they got to be really creative with their prose. Like the truth was, oh, good. Thin, but man yeah no it's it's headlines of history hashtag (laughs) one of my favorites so true oh gosh tim van ram's opening a a a can of worms here like it always does educated guests on sutro's burial site you know i don't but maybe he was moved like everyone else to colma i mean right we, yeah, I'm, I hope I remember this correctly, but technically he has a niche at the columbarium here, but it's empty. And then- See, I um, haven't looked for him on find a grave. Like there's findagrave.com that's free. Yeah. I don't know that I've looked for him there actually. I mean, Leah's uh-huh. buried in coma and there is his name next to it, but he's not actually there from what it sounds like. And then there was one point when um, a maritime historian thought maybe he found him in an urn at Sutro Heights. Um, But then uh, that turned out not to be true. It's just solid concrete. So um, very mysterious. It is. I mean, it was totally secular. So, you know, that isn't an issue. But um, yeah, we should check out Find a Grave. I'll take a look. Someone knows. (laughs) <laughs> someone does know right um we did a podcast on where the where the heck he's buried and it's always it's interesting that you bring up how secular he was we've had a few groups I don't know if you're experiencing this but we're getting a wave of requests to assist with new historic plaques and I don't know that it's a great time to be putting up monuments but 
Um, that's another story we're not going to step into. But someone, a group wants to, um, a Jewish cultural group wants to fund a plaque for Adolf Sutro based on all he did for the Jewish faith. And I was like, do much for the Jewish faith. <laughs> yeah. like- he was about the city like he really was a civic minded person you know that like nowhere has it ever been shown that he was religious ever never belonged to a temple so i mean prove me wrong yeah yeah exactly that should be the byline to all of our events (laughs) prove us wrong um i I have worked to I've had, yeah, exactly, right? We like you to, to question. Yeah, what we're tell me the real thing. One. We've, I also heard he was cremated, which if I understand the Jewish faith correctly is not what you do in the Jewish faith, but um, what do I know? <laughs> I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Thanks, Tim, for, for taking us down that road. Um, and Kevin has a point about accessibility for the Sutra Library. I don't know if you can see that, Diana, it's... Uh, okay well so accessibility it parking is not close there are are free parking places but there's a disability resource center at san francisco state and you can uh have like a go like a golf cart um passage back and forth from the garage and it can be arranged prior and it's not that difficult so, you know, even if there's some problems, there's, there's definitely resources that can help. Kevin is saying um, back in the day, he's wondering about accessibility. Like if like Sutro collected all of these things for the public and then it just got stashed. Oh yeah, the- absolutely. No, this was going to be a public library. Like I, I know there was a lot of slides that I showed, but like the article for the, the building, like that was like his plan like he had initially tried to give it to UCSF and there was problems with that donation then he just decided you know what San Francisco needs a great library like the New York Public Library right like it's not just a library it's an archives it has history it has everything you could ever think of so that that really was Sutro's sort of goal it blows my mind the scale that he always imagined that, you know, he wasn't like, I'm just going to build a tiny bathhouse. He's like, I'm going to build this, the biggest thing ever constructed. I'm not just going to collect books. I'm going to found the biggest library on the West Coast. I just, those kinds of people are um, always so impressive to me. Yeah, I mean, people at the time, and really, as I said, like, because Sutro has never had a permanent home, because of its just history, it just hasn't had the recognition, but like when Sutro died, it was reported he had the largest private library in like the world, not just the US. So, you know, who's to know? How many libraries have we lost to fire? Seriously, it, it's incredible. Like I, I just had a fire in my kitchen and on the in the oven, and I can't even tell you how hard it was to put out. And it was just like, this localized little fire. I had a, it, anyway, fire is unpredictable and yes, so destructive and has destroyed so many libraries. And this wouldn't be a San Francisco history if we didn't mention the 1906 earthquake and fire. It literally comes up in everything we do. And this, and he lost, we lost a lot of, of books and history in that fire. Like Sutro's was one of the only libraries to survive. Like Bancroft, I guess technically Bancroft kind of his library did survive, but like he wasn't necessarily technically in what was San Francisco at the time. So anyway, I mean, details. Yeah. <laughs> details are important. <laughs> They're very important. They are. All right. Well, we're coming up on a solid hour. Does anybody have any more questions for Diana? Um, Lori made a comment earlier that she's never seen a photo of Adolf Sutro without his gray whiskers. It's always, uh, it's always, it, it, there was more color on the photo that you showed. Yeah, no, I want it because this is all online. I obviously want it to, to be a visual thing so that you feel like, hey, like I know this history. I'm following this person to the new world. Like, you know, yeah. <laughs> well, you did a great job. Oh, one more question that is completely selfish in nature. Do you have anything on former president Theodore Roosevelt? 
asking for a friend. I mean, if we do, it's very random, but you could look just to the California State Library's website because the California State, like we are a part of the California State Library, but we're the Sutro. So the California State Library has so much California history, so many original documents, um, like from Sutter Fort, from early history, um, but it has a law library. It has a braille and talking book library, which if anyone is interested or, or knows someone that needs that, it is a free service that if you have some kind of disability where you cannot read or you cannot, like it, it will make accessible no matter what, and there's no copyright issues. So no matter what book you want, you can get it. So it's an amazing resource, but um, yeah, like there's the California history room there, there's information services. So it, it's just, there's a ton of stuff there just all in Sacramento and we're out here. Oh, because, uh, because Sucho intended the library to be for San Francisco, the stipulation and the deed to the state library was that we could never leave the city limits of San Francisco. Uh, so, yeah. He was a thinker. That's true. Yeah. I, there's that one famous photo of him in his library with like the statuary all around him um, where he's like pensively looking out the window. And I think that's my favorite photo of him because I just imagine him sitting there with a cup of tea, which he didn't have, but I'm imagining it and looking out over Sutro Heights and, and the ocean and enjoying his library. And that's how I like to think of him as the peaceful man who enjoyed what he gave to San Francisco. And he really cared about books. You know, he really did. So yeah, it's it's great that we have this great treasure. And then now we're in a place where more people will find us as including students. So yeah, it's and social media has helped to like bring also our collections out there. But yeah, I, I see a question about are we still adding stuff? And we are. And I mentioned way back that my, the director, Maddie, had put out a call when the Women's March in 2017 occurred. We have the largest collection of posters of that Women's March in California um, and all the repositories in California. So some of those have been digitized and you can look at them and some of them are just part of our collection. But um, you know, you can look on our Omika site, but we also have stuff on the online archive of California. So you can kind of take a look, but like, if you just actually want to see the images, go to Sutra Library Omika, O-M-E-K-A. And there are so many images and stuff up there, including the Women's March. Um, not all of them, but what we have digitized so far. What's your collecting statement? Like, um, uh, what's your mission statement and collecting statement? Like we're focused on the West side, right? So we take things having to do with the West side. So like what, if I'm wondering if you'll take my things, like, oh, how do I know? Oh, um, well, so genealogy, if we don't have it, or if it's something rare, um, you know, sort of that's a case by case basis. I mean, it would have to fit in with the fact that we have, we're really interested in collecting in women's history. Nice. Um, so we're trying to build that up. Um, there's areas that we definitely want, but I mean, you know, it just depends because we have every subject yeah. you could possibly imagine. Well, um, you're reminding me that I need to get back there just to like sniff around in your archives because everything yeah. is amazing. Um, are you doing in-person programming or is that on the horizon or are you still kind of waiting out the pandemic? We're hoping, well, so I've talked to Maddie about when our next actual exhibit in the reading room will go up and we're hoping for January. Awesome. Um, so there isn't much in person in, in terms of like, except coming to use certain items. So you can book an appointment, but there's not a lot of public programming right now. It's just all virtual, but, um, and we just had our last virtual event of the year, but we have done some really sort of innovative stuff on the genealogy side. Um, we have a librarian who does that programming and she's done stuff on like critical family history where you look at sort of your family history in terms of the way it might've like 
subjugated and had bias towards others or like maybe your ancestors owned slaves. So like we've had some of that kind of family history. We've also had some stuff on Sutro and, and the fact that like the Sutro Bass did not allow African-Americans in. So it's kind of not like the greatest thing, but you know, we wanna have these discussions. So yeah, if you go to our website, we have a calendar. Um, and, you know, if anything, just send us an email if that's easiest and we'll just answer your questions. Yeah, there are human beings behind the library. People forget that. There's only five of us at Sutro. <laughs> yeah. So we're, it's, yeah, it's, it's all, it can be very intimate. <laughs> I know I keep joking when people send emails through different parts of our um, website. I'm like, it all comes to one person. It we does, yeah. The There's <laughs> many ways to get to us um, and we will get back to you. Yeah. So, I'm probably, yeah. If you just want to send an email, we're just sutro at library.ca.gov, but you can go to our like California State Library and find all of that stuff there. Perfect. And I'm dropping a link in the chat right now. Um, if, if you liked this program and you'd like to support future programs like this, it's my duty as executive director to encourage you to donate to Western Neighborhoods Project. We are a 501c3 nonprofit and we do a whole lot for a little organization. So we appreciate you being here tonight and for supporting future work. And Diana, how can people financially support the Sutra Library? Actually, you can donate to the California State Library Foundation. Um, we, we can't take them directly, but the foundation provides us with funding for programming and Zoom stuff. And, and so yeah, definitely, um, easy to Google, but I can also put a link in. It's really, yeah. Yeah, let's get folks a link. We're also, I'll send out okay. a follow-up email being like, hey, thanks for being with us. Here's yeah, no, program. let me, um, let me just, yeah. So actually the, the foundation puts out a free journal with stuff about the collections. So that's kind of another great way to find out about the collections and things that you can find. Um, here is the link. Perfect. We'll save a copy of the chat as well and send it as a follow-up um, as well as with the link folks have been asking on the recording of tonight's program that will be on the Outside Lands uh, San Francisco um, YouTube page. So I think that is all. If there's anything else, Diana, you'd like to add for tonight? No, and reach out if you have any questions. Well, thank you so much for being here. This this has been a true delight and we'll be in incredible. Oh, thanks. It was fun. I yeah, it's lovely to share this free library and to have so many lovely people to share it with. So thank you. Exactly. So thank you everyone for being here tonight. We'll sign off, but remember to come visit us at the Museum at the Cliff Thursdays through Sundays, 11 to 4 p.m. or stop by our office at 1617 Balboa Street where you will find me sitting exactly where I am today with all these other Cliff House artifacts on display. So without further ado, have a great rest of your night and we'll see you later. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs>